Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to class on person and work of the Holy Spirit. All of you excited to study about the Holy Spirit? Yes, okay. Uh, last week, we had uh, some really good questions. It was very interesting uh, to hear the questions, just to answer them. And so it was a good learning as well. So thank you for those questions. So let the questions keep coming because uh, it just helps you to, you know, think through, to get more clarity, uh, to get uh, the right answers and the right perspective. Okay. So um, before we begin, we'll just pause for a word of prayer. So can one of our uh, uh, in-person students, anyone would like to lead us in prayer, please? Can you lead us in prayer? Almighty Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful day, Lord, my Father. Today, today you brought us here, Lord. Uh, you equipped us here. And today, uh, give us the knowledge and wisdom so that we can understand um, whatever uh, the scriptures tells, Lord. And uh, just give us, uh, make us understand whatever pastor is going to teach us, Lord. Uh, please help us uh, to grow more, Lord, my Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, I'm praying. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, so um, last week, uh, this is the last class I'll be teaching on Holy Spirit. Uh, next week, Pastor Paul Emanuel is back. He's a course instructor. He's the one who's teaching you on the Holy Spirit, so he'll continue to teach. So I'll just finish whatever I can uh, today, this uh, two hours, and then he will continue from next week. Okay, he's back on Monday. Okay, so last week, what did we study? Who is the Holy Spirit? God. He is God, yes. Okay. And we also studied about the? Trinity. Trinity, yes. What's another name for Trinity? Do we find the name Trinity in the Bible? No, we don't find the word Trinity in the Bible. We don't find the term Trinity in the Bible, but we find the term Godhead in the Bible. Bible, okay. So, what is the meaning of Trinity? One one God exists eternally in three persons. Wow! Thank you, Anthony. That's so encouraging. One God, one God who eternally exists in three persons. Okay. Yes, one God who eternally exists in three persons: God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy spirit great okay um so we see that even uh, are that do we believe or worship three gods yes no we don't worship three gods we only worship one god where do we find that in the bible where do we find that in the bible Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Okay? And also Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Okay? Uh, where we see the word Godhead. But where do we see the Trinity? Again mentioned 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Now these two are very important verses. If somebody can reduce the volume of my mic, please, because I already have an inbuilt microphone. My voice is too loud, and I don't want it to be so loud. Thank you. So where do we find in the Bible that there is only one God? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Okay, two verses. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and... 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Okay. Where do we find the word Godhead in the Bible? Romans chapter 1, verse 20. All these are very important verses, which is important for you to keep in mind and also to memorize very short Bible verses. So you can just, when people ask you, you can just show it to them. Okay. Then we looked at various scripture passages where we established. Uh, how we see the Trinity in action. Can you give me some examples where we see the Trinity in action? 
Genesis chapter 1, verses 2, 1, 2, and 3. Okay. What else? Verse 32 and 35. Okay. Matthew 28, verse 19, the baptismal formula, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We also see at Jesus' baptism, Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And we saw numerous other scripture passages where we see um, uh, the Trinity in action, where we see the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit uh, um, you know, mentioned in those scripture passages. Then we moved on to lesson two, right? And we began studying lesson two. We started studying, we looked at the person of the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, we know that, that we believe and worship only God who eternally exists in three distinct personalities, okay? So God the Father is a distinct personality, God the Son is a distinct personality. God the Holy Spirit is a distinct personality. That is why God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, three distinct personalities. What do we mean by distinct personalities? They are different persons, but yet they are one. They are one in nature. They are one in attributes. They are one in characteristics. They are one in unity. Okay? Yes, that is what we're saying. The personalities are not different. Three persons. Personalities are not different. Mindsets are not different. Three different persons, but yet they are one, which means that they have the same nature, same attributes, same characteristics. You don't have the same nature or attributes or characteristics as anybody else in this class. Nobody in this class has the same nature, attributes, characteristics as distinct to me. They might have few of characteristics or nature that I have, but something that is exclusively distinct of me, not everyone will have that same combination. Okay, But in the Godhead, each one of them, even though they are distinct persons, they are one. Okay, They have one mind, one uh, nature, same attributes, same characteristics. Okay? So that is very, very important. And we looked at the why do we say the Holy Spirit is God? How can we say Holy Spirit is God? How can you prove that somebody is God? You have to look, prove their nature, right? If you're proving that Jesus Christ is God, you have to prove that he has the nature, the attributes, the characteristic that makes God God. So what are the characteristics or the nature that makes God God? Omnipresence, omnipotence, omniscience. What else? There's no full stop after that. Eternal, sovereign, yes, eternal and sovereign. Okay. So we looked at all of these last week. Yes or no? Yes. So we looked at how uh, the Holy Spirit is omnipotent. What is the meaning of omnipotent? Present everywhere. All power. Go ahead. That is omni. <laughs> That's omnipresent. Yes. Thank you, Anthony. Good try. Omnipresent is present everywhere. Omnipotent is all powerful. Omniscient is all knowing. Yes. All knowing. Sees everything. Sient. No. Sees. Omni. All. Okay. So we see that he uh, he is all of these natures as God. He's eternal. What's the meaning of eternal? Forever, no beginning, no end. Always was, always is, always will be. Okay, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. And he is um, sovereign. What does sovereign mean? What does sovereign mean? Sovereign. Who is the powerful? Only? Sovereign means he does what he pleases, what he wills, okay? God does what he wills. You can do what you will, but God will also do what he has established and willed in his heart and his mind, okay? So he's sovereign. So we also see that uh, G, the Holy Spirit, if he is God, he has to be co-equal with 
God the Father and God the Son. Yes, he has to be co-equal with God the Father and God the Son. So how can he be proved that the Holy Spirit is co-equal with God the Father and God the Son? Genesis 1 verses 1 to 3. Okay, what else? Sorry? Isaiah 11. Okay, all of the references that we looked at in chapter 1. The baptismal formula, the baptism of Jesus, and the birth of Jesus, everything where we see the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit also proves to us all of those scripture passages. We're not going to be looking at it again, but all of those scripture passages that we looked at in chapter 1 proves that the Holy Spirit is equal with God the Father and God the Son. Now, it's very important to pay attention to the study on the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit, who is the third person of the Trinity, is the most misinterpreted, the most misunderstood person of the Trinity. Some people even don't believe that the Holy Spirit is God. They just believe that he's some force, he's wind, he's a power of God, he's a spirit of God, but they don't believe that he is God. Okay, so it's very important for you to go back and read these notes because all of you are going to become pastors and teachers and you need to help people to get a right perspective of who the Holy Spirit is. Okay, so when people say, okay, prove to me that Holy Spirit is God, you can pull out all the references that we looked at in chapter one and it proves that Holy Spirit is equal with, co-equal with God the Father and God the son okay and we also see that he has the nature and the attributes of god which we looked at in the beginning of this chapter okay and i'm just going to give you a couple more references okay if you look at second corinthians chapter 13 verse 14 and if you look at first peter chapter 1 verse 2 all of them talk about the Godhead or the Trinity in that. So can somebody please read 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, and someone else can read 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, please. Who has the mic? I'd like you to pass on the mic quickly to somebody. There are two mics, right? Yes, no? Who is reading? First Corinth, Second Corinthians 13, 14. Our online students, you're also welcome to unmute and read, please. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So here we see the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God, talking about love of God, which God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So here we see Father, Son and Holy Spirit co-equal. First Peter chapter 1 verse 2. Can somebody read that please? Who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of the God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sparkled with his blood. Sprinkling of his blood by his blood. Sorry, sprinkled with his blood and grace and peace be yours in abundance. Amen. So here, thank you. So here we see the foreknowledge of God the Father. So God the Father is mentioned. The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Okay. And the obedience of Jesus. Christ. So we see all of the Godhead mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. So here these verses also show that the Holy Spirit is co-equal with God, the Father, God, the Son, but yet he is a separate or distinct person. Okay. Now we look at how the, uh, we look at some scripture passages that show to us that the Holy Spirit and God are one. Okay, so we're going to look at a few verses. I don't think this is in your notes. We're going to look at a few verses in the Old Testament, which is talking about or referring to God. But the same verse, 
in the Old Testament, when it is quoted in the New Testament, is this instead of God, it's ascribed to the Holy Spirit. So by looking at these references, we are trying to prove that the Holy Spirit is equal with God or the Holy Spirit and God are one. Okay, so do you get that? We're looking at some Old Testament scripture where it's mentioned or ascribed to God. The same scripture, the Old Testament, when it is uh, mentioned in the New Testament, the same thing is attributed to the or ascribed to the Holy Spirit. So can somebody please read Isaiah chapter 6 verses 8 to 10 and then somebody else can read Acts chapter 28 verses 25 to 27. Isaiah 6, 8 to 10, and, I, and Acts chapter 28, verses 25 to 27. Yes, go ahead and read, please. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying... So here oh, it says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, yes. Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said... Go and tell this people, be every hearing, but ever hearing, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people collapsed, calloused, calloused, make their eyes dull and close their eyes. Sorry, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. So here, if you note, who's talking here? The Lord. Who is the Lord? God the Father. Okay. Now, the same verse is, uh, you know, is mentioned in Acts chapter 28, verses 25 to 37. Okay. Uh, look at what it says. Can somebody read Acts 8, 25 to 27, please? Please use the mic so that our online students can hear. Thank you. So when so when they did not agree among them themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet to our fathers. Okay. Continue reading 25 to 27. For the hearts of these people have gr grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Amen. So here we see in Acts chapter 28 that, uh, you know, people, they disagreed among themselves, okay? And they began to leave after Paul had made his final statement. So we are in Acts chapter 28. And um, we see, you know, Paul is witnessing here in um, uh, witness in Rome. Okay. And so people disagreed among themselves and they began to leave. And after that, Paul made his statement and he says the holy spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said to isaiah the prophet go to this people and say you will be ever hearing and never understanding so here we see that paul is quoting who who is paul quoting isaiah and when uh, isaiah is telling this who does he say is speaking this the lord but when paul is saying the same thing he's mentioning it. He's saying, who speaks this? The Holy Spirit spoke. That means the Lord, that is God the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. You can either mention, you mention Holy Spirit, it's God, God the, God the Father. You mention God the Father, it's the Holy Spirit, one and the same. Now let's look at two more scripture passages. Can someone else please read Psalm 95 verse 7 to 11? And Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. Are you able to understand what I'm trying to show you all here? Yes, no? Yes, okay. Psalm 95, 7 to 11. And Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the folk, the flock, under, the flock under his care. Today, 
if only you would hear his voice do not harden your hearts as you did at meriba meriba as you did that day as masaya in at the masa masa in the wilderness where your ancestors tested me they tried me though they have they had seen what i did for 40 years i was angry angry with that generation i said they are a people whose hearts go astray and they have not known my ways so i declared on oath in my anger they shall never enter my rest amen so here he is saying that um, the psalmist is saying talking about the israelites in the in the wilderness when they're journeying right and he says um, for he is our god and we are the people of his pasture the flock under his care today if you hear his voice whose voice god's voice he got the father's voice and then if you read hebrews chapter 3 verse 7 and 9 can somebody read that please therefore as the holy spirit says today if you will hear his voice do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me tried me and saw my works 40 years therefore yes so here the writer of hebrews is talking about the same thing which the psalmist is talking about but here he is saying who's who is saying this the holy spirit okay so here we can see from these verses that god and the holy spirit are one okay so wherever you refer to as god where is refer to as holy spirit to see that holy spirit and god are one we looked at one more reference can anyone remember in the in the in the first class in acts chapter 5 we read about ananias and sapphira right where paul uh, when when they come to ananias comes to peter and he says you know is this all the money you got from selling the land what does uh, ananias say yes and what does paul peter reply you have lied to you have lied to god first he says you've lied to god first and as soon as he says that ananias drops down dead and then we see later on his wife safira comes and then she also says hey this is the money we got for selling our land and what does paul say you have lied to the holy spirit so again here it's proving that you know when you lie you lying to the holy spirit is equal to lying to god so the holy spirit and god are one all of you able to understand yes no or is going above your heads what about our okay thank you anthony thank you sabagya okay so we just proving from scripture that wherever it's mentioned about god the same thing when it's reference or spoken about in the new testament instead of saying god or the lord it's mentioned as the holy spirit so we're saying holy spirit and god are one okay we also see from scripture that holy spirit is a person right yes or no holy spirit is a person okay so which means the holy spirit is not some force is not some power and how do we know the holy spirit is a person because when we read scripture passages the holy spirit is referred to as whom he yes not referred to as it it's referred to as a person refers to as he and it's a capital h so wherever you see a capital h it you know that you're reading about the holy spirit or god the son or god the father okay because it's talking about the god head okay so if you look at these various scripture passages i'm not going to ask us to open and read each one of them if you look at john chapter 14 verse 16 and verse 17 and verse 26 Uh, John chapter fifteen was twenty six. John chapter fifteen sixteen was thirteen. Luke chapter twelve verses eleven to twelve. Acts chapter thirteen was two, and Romans chapter eight was twenty six. All of these. Are you taking it down? Yes. Okay. John fourteen sixteen and seventeen and twenty six. John chapter sixteen was thirteen. 
Luke chapter 12, verses 11 to 12. Luke chapter 12, verses 11 to 12. Acts chapter 13, verse 2. And Romans chapter 8, verse 26. All of this is referring to the Holy Spirit. And when you read the scripture passages, it's mentioned as He, capital H, H-E, He. He referring to the Holy Spirit. So we see that Holy Spirit is a person. If he's a person, that means he needs to have a personality, right? So he's not just some force, he's not some influence, but he's rather an individual who has personalities. So if a person has personalities, what are some of the personalities? Love. Emotions. Love is an emotion. What else? If you're a person, what should you have? You should have a personality, yes? So what is your personality? Your emotions? Huh? Your willpower, yes? Your nature, okay? Huh? Desires, attributes, okay? Qualities. Behaviors, qualities, okay. You need to have an intellect, right? You need to have a mind, right? For to have a human personality, you have a mind, you have emotions, you have a will, okay, you understand things. So when we say that the Holy Spirit is a person, that means he has a personality. So we look at um, you know, uh yeah, that means he has all the attributes and the qualities that are associated with, with distinct personalities, okay? So we look at some of the personalities that the Holy Spirit has. Last week, there was a very interesting question. One of the students said, when God is spirit, then how can he have a gender? That means, why do we refer to God as he, okay? Yes, for God, he is a, a spirit being, so it's... Is, it's not necessary for him to have a gender. He does not have a gender. But there is a gender that this uh, we call him by. Why? Because he, when he relates, he relates to us as a person. Okay? Because we are persons. We have personalities. We are able to understand other persons who have personalities. Right? So for us to understand and know God, he, re he reveals himself to us. He relates to himself to us as a person. But why, the question was, why is it a he and not a she? Why? Because basically we live in a patriarchal society based on the culture uh, that we come from. It's basically patriarchal. Old Testament, basically fully patriarchal. Even in the Jewish uh, customs and laws, it was patriarchal and even when we see uh, the offices okay of god the god is what are some of the offices that he fulfills offices of the of god offices what are some of the offices of god he's a king he's a priest right he's a prophet Yes, he's somebody. Uh, so when we look at the prophet, priest, and king, which is basically some of the offices that we attribute to God, it is all male dominated. Yes or no? Yes, we see that in the Old Testament. We see that even in the New Testament. So it makes sense when people attribute the gender of God to and he and not a she. Okay? Because that is how even people can relate. People don't relate to people. Um, they find it even in our generation today, people find it difficult to call women in ministry as pastors. Okay, they can call you as sister, uh, they can call you some by your name, but it's very difficult for them to attribute and see you as a pastor. Okay, so why? Because we live in a patriarchal society, that is our culture, the mindset that we have been uh, growing up with. So, God uses the same culture, He works in the culture. Even when Jesus came, he, he worked in the culture and background. Why did Jesus have to wait 30 years before he started his ministry? Why? 
because of the culture what was the culture <laughs> wait wait waiting for god's time waiting for god's appointed time okay yes the jewish law says that a teacher can teach in the synagogue only after he is 30 years old so when jesus turned 30 he went to the synagogue he took out the scroll and said this is you know fulfilled in your hearing so jesus follow the customs and the culture of his day and his time okay so he's very cognizant of the fact that he has to follow the jewish customs and laws and in that context that's why we attribute god as a, a he okay and not as a, a she but because he's a spirit being he's outside gender outside time space and gender but to relate to us yes he relates to us as a person and he also has a personality so all of you with me yes okay so we look at some of the personalities of the holy spirit because the holy spirit relates to us as and he um, and so we look at the holy spirit has a personality so the first thing we look at is the holy spirit has an intellect intellect means what what's the meaning of intellect He has a mind, right? He can think. He has a mind, okay? Um, so we see that he has a mind. He can think. He searches. Look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 says. Can somebody read that, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things as the deep things of God. Amen. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, it says that the Holy Spirit does what? What does the Holy Spirit do? Searches, Searches all things. The de yes, the deep things of God. Okay. So what does it mean here? It means that the Holy Spirit has complete knowledge. The Holy Spirit has complete understanding of everything, including the profound and the hidden aspects of God's nature and purposes okay so the term searches you know doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is seeking for knowledge or looking for knowledge it does not mean um, you know that he doesn't know something and so he's searching like when we don't know something we go to Google right <laughs> or we go ask somebody or we uh, find out from somewhere but it's not that when we say that the Holy Spirit searches all things, it does not mean that the Holy Spirit is seeking knowledge. It does not mean that he doesn't know something, so he's searching something. It's basically conveying the idea that the Holy Spirit fully comprehends, fully explores the depths of God's wisdom, and he reveals that to the believers. I'll repeat that. So the Holy here it's conveying that the Holy Spirit fully comprehends and explores the depths of God's wisdom and he reveals this to the believers, okay? And so we see that the Holy Spirit acts as the one who makes known to us the deep truths about God that we cannot understand in our own intellect, in our own understanding. So, if you look at this verse, the essence of this verse or this verse basically highlights that the Holy Spirit's role in revealing the divine mysteries, the deep spiritual truths of who Jesus Christ is or revealing to us the divine mysteries or the deep spiritual truths of who God the Father is. What did Jesus say when he goes to the Father? He will send whom? The Holy Spirit. And what would the Holy Spirit do? He will reveal all things to you. He will testify about me to you. Okay. So that is what the Holy Spirit does. So searches means not that the Holy Spirit doesn't know. So he's looking or he's searching. This is very important because people can take, pick up all of these verses and say, hey, look, the Holy Spirit searches. That means he doesn't know. So how can you say he's God? Okay. So you need to tell him that it's not that he's seeking knowledge. If somebody, if this means that, you know, the Holy Spirit fully explores, fully comprehends the depths of God's wisdom and he reveals that to us as believers. Or he makes known to us the truth about God that we cannot understand on our 
own. Amen? All of you understanding? Some of you are in Lala land, glory land. Okay. Okay. Look at what Acts chapter 15 verse 28 says. Can somebody read that please? It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burn you with anything beyond the following requirements. Yes. So here in Acts chapter 15, there is a council that is happening. And in that council, the Jews are saying, hey, now the Gentiles are also becoming believers. And so we need to ask them to follow certain Jewish laws and customs. Like one of them is circumcision. So they're saying all the Gentiles who become believers in Jesus Christ, they have to be circumcised. And Paul and Peter are saying it's not needed. And finally, what happens? It says the Holy Spirit, okay, was making his mind and thoughts very clear to the apostles regarding what the Gentiles should observe, right? So here we see that the Holy Spirit has a mind and he's revealing that mind in to the people about what is his decision, okay? Able to understand all of you? Any questions so far? Thank you, Elkana. Any questions? Thank you, Siraj. Okay. The second thing is we can say that the Holy Spirit is a person, has a personality, is because he knows the truth and he is the truth. Okay. So can somebody please read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For what a man knows, the things of man ex except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so one so no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Amen. Can someone else please read Romans 8.26? Thank you, Vinay. Anyone else? Romans 8.26? can pass on the mic to somebody else. Romans 8.26, please. Divya, would like to read? Okay, he's reading. Romans 8. So then, 26. if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded? Are you reading uh, Romans 8.26, please? Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, weaknesses. For what we do not know, what we should pray for us as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with growings which cannot be uttered. Yes. So here we see that the Holy Spirit has a mind, right? He reveals what is in his mind. That means if he has a mind, he has a uh, mind, has ideas, thoughts, feelings, and purpose. So here we see that the Holy Spirit, you know, um, it says, for who, the, for the man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Okay, so here we're saying that the Holy Spirit knows the truth and he is the truth. So we're saying that basically the Holy Spirit is the embodiment of truth. He possesses complete knowledge of all things, especially the things of God. Now, when we say that the Holy Spirit is the embodiment of truth, what does it mean? It just means basically that the Holy Spirit fully represents or he en encompasses the truth in its purest form, okay? Or, and we're also saying that the Holy Spirit is the source of all truth. And because he's the source of all truth, he's guiding believers into understanding what is true, understanding what is righteous, what is aligned with God's will. So the Holy Spirit does not just know the truth. He's the truth himself. Because he embodies the truth, which means he fully represents, he fully encompasses the truth in its purest form. Okay, so um, we see that the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, is the truth himself. Okay, and he ensures that everything that he is revealing about God the Father, God the Son, everything that he's communicating to us about God the Father, God the Son, is perfectly accurate and re re reliable, okay? So in essence, the Holy Spirit cannot mislead you 
cannot misguide you because his very nature is the truth. And that is what even Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And God says that he cannot lie because he is the truth. So the Holy Spirit is also truth. So if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, which is read to us, what, what does it mean? This verse basically explains to us that just as a person's spirit knows their thoughts and their inner workings. Now your own spirit knows your thoughts. Your own spirit knows your inner workings. In the same way, only the spirit of God can fully understand and know the mind and the heart of God. Which means the Holy Spirit is intimately acquainted with God the Father, God the Son, and hence is intimately acquainted with God's thoughts, purposes, and plans. And because the Holy Spirit is God, he only knows the truth, and he is a, in essence, he is the truth himself, so the Holy Spirit can only reveal the truth to us because he is the source of truth and he possesses all truth. So that is what it is a meaning when we read this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Now, what does it mean when we, uh, this verse which we read, Romans chapter 8, verse 26? Likewise, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Holy Spirit himself reveals to us, or the Holy Spirit himself makes intercession with us with groanings that cannot be uttered, okay? So what does it mean? It basically teaches us the Holy Spirit knows our weaknesses, the Holy Spirit knows our limitations, especially in the aspect of prayer. Okay, we do not know what we need to, ought to pray for. When somebody says, "Hey, pray for me for this," or when we are going to some situation, we do not know what to pray for. So the Holy Spirit basically communicates the mind, the purpose, and the plan of God re regarding that person you're praying for, regarding that situation you're praying for, because the Holy Spirit knows the heart, mind, the purpose, and the plan of God. And he's revealing that to you. Okay, So he's communicating that to you, whether you're speaking it in a language that you understand, or with groanings that cannot be uh, uttered, which means you're deeply mourning, you're crying out, or you're praying in the spirit, you can't understand, but you are praying according to God's mind, according to God's plan, according to God's will for that specific situation. Okay, all of you with me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. So here we see that the Holy Spirit possesses a mind, which means he has ideas, he has thoughts, he has feelings, he has purposes. So what do we learn from this? What do we learn from this? Come on, what do we learn from this? Now this is something easy, all of you can apply. Sorry, please take the mic and speak, please. What do we learn from this? Holy Spirit knows everything. He has a mind. Okay, that we have already studied. So how can you apply that in your life? How can you apply that truth in your life? That the Holy Spirit has a mind. He searches all things. He knows the truth. He reveals the truth. So how can you apply that in your lives? Come we on, wake up everybody and think. We need to pray in spirit and seek the help of Holy Spirit. Okay, so when you don't know what to pray for some of the aspects in your life, right? You really don't know. You're going through a situation. You don't know what is happening. You're facing a challenging situation in a relationship. You're going through a crisis in your job, in your business, whatever, or something with related with your spouse or your children. You just don't know. You don't have the words. You're just crying out to God. Maybe you're praying in the spirit. You can even ask the Holy Spirit to help you to pray according to God's heart, mind, and will. Okay, say, Holy Spirit, you know the truth. You know the truth about the situation. I really don't know. I'm not able to understand. Can you please reveal? Can you just show me what I need to do? What's the next step? Anything else? He all, Holy Spirit also prays for us with our deep breath. Yes, he, but here, that is a wrong idea that people have, that when, when we don't know what to pray, that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. But 
here actually the meaning of is is the, the likewise the holy spirit helps us in our weakness okay uh, and it says but the holy spirit himself makes intercessions for us so it doesn't mean that the holy spirit is praying independent of us but it says the holy spirit helps us in our weakness that means the holy spirit alongside with us it's not like when we are having a problem the holy spirit somewhere up separate and he's praying no he prays along with us so that is how he helps us in our weakness he prays alongside with us because the greek word for the holy spirit is parakletos and what is being a parakletos the greek word for holy spirit is parakletos and what does parakletos mean p a r a k e l e t o s parakletos p a r a k e l e t o s so he's a helper he's somebody who comes alongside us he comes alongside us to aid us to support us to encourage us to build us so everything that the holy spirit does in your life is not independent of you he does it along with you so he is somebody who comes alongside us to help us to aid us and to support us right so suppose you're married you have your spouse who comes alongside you to aid you to support you right suppose you are um, you know you have siblings you have your siblings who comes alongside you you are very close to certain siblings your brother or sister they come alongside you to help you maybe if for a child the parents come alongside to help them and to aid them in the same way the holy spirit who is a paracletos he comes alongside us to aid us and to help us so what else do we learn or how do we apply what we learn about the holy spirit here come on everybody think the holy spirit has a mind we looked at various references holy spirit knows the truth the holy spirit searches things so what how can we apply that in our lives online students can you take the mic please helps us to decide things when we are confused yes right or wrong even if both are right like what should i do what is right for me yes very true the holy spirit is the truth he will reveal the truth what is the truth what is right in that situation or what is the right thing that you need to do in a specific situation whether it's in your business in your job in your career in whatever situations you're going through the holy spirit will reveal what else what else remember when we read acts chapter 15 was 28 what was happening in acts chapter 15 where everyone agreed together there was some disagreement right yes so what does the holy spirit do he so, speaks to the different people and it's the holy spirit who makes his mind clear and finally they are able to the jerusalem council is going able to bring about an law an order saying hey gentiles should not follow jewish customs so what do we learn from that brings clarity yes when there is in your uh, when you're working in an office or as your husband and wife you're making a decision as a family you're making a decision all of you have different ideas you know and you don't know what's the truth you can ask the holy spirit to speak in church you know when you are all part or in the bible college all of you as stud students in so many students of first year right all of you are trying to decide about something and all of you have different ideas there's no consensus you can pray and ask the holy and that is kind of become becoming a strife and a rift you can ask the holy spirit to speak so the holy spirit will speak and will change the ideas will present the truth to people and then whatever he minds whatever he wills or he purposes will come to pass okay so uh, these are some of the areas that we can apply okay we'll go for our break and we'll come back and then we'll continue